Hey guys, welcome to the HPL Podcast. On this week's show, I'm joined by a fitness industry legend, coach and athlete Dan John. He's going to be sharing a number of his great stories and key lessons based on all of his experience in this field. He's also going to be providing us his core values on training, nutrition and lifestyle and why understanding and practicing the fundamentals are so important, right from being a beginner with it all and of course even up to being an elite athlete. And a very rare opportunity to listen to so much information and content from such an awesome guy. So stay tuned for that. I also wanted to quickly announce that it's competition time. That's right. This is your opportunity to win a totally free space on my six months nutrition and exercise coaching program. It's therefore for anyone who wants to maximize their high performance living. That's to look feel and perform at your best. In summary then, you'll receive a clear, actionable and tailored program that's been created specifically to achieve your goals and fit in with your lifestyle. It's my own personal coaching to provide all that support, guidance and accountability you'll need to achieve high performance living. The door is open for the next course on the 1st of July. There's some limited spaces to get on this coaching program with myself. So in order to enter this competition, all you need to do is leave a ratings and reviews over on iTunes. Now, if you've already left one, that means you're automatically entered into this competition. Pretty cool, right? At the minute, we have 67 ratings on there. That's some fantastic odds for an awesome competition for six months coaching, working directly with myself. As I say, doors open 1st of July, and therefore, all the reviews taken between now and next week when I read out the winner are going to be automatically entered into there. So all you need to do is click on the ratings and review tabs in iTunes, leave how many stars you feel this podcast is worth, write a quick review, hit posts, and hey presto, you are automatically entered. That's it this week, guys. Enjoy the show, and of course, see you on the other side. As promised then, guys, on the other end of the line, I'm joined by Dan John. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great today. Um... It's been a rainy couple of days, and we got blue skies. Awesome, oh. man. So you've been across in the UK lately there, right? Just um, in England doing some talks and stuff. How yeah. was that? I was in Vienna, and then I came back, and then two days later I went back to London, and then I came back, and uh, that was a mistake in some ways. But i tell you one thing, my miles, my sky miles went through the roof, so that's good. Yeah, uh, you're living the jet setter lifestyle, Dan. Oh, well... If there's a okay, there is a bonus there. I you know I'm a Delta Diamond, and they treat me they treat me really nicely, and they they're very kind to me. And they, that's great. In those 23 hour days, they're very nice to me. Uh, so that's you know that's good. But uh, with uh, the Vienna talk, I did uh, basically I went over how I assess, and then you know I think the hardest thing when you're a coach or trainer really is it's what to do for the next two weeks. I mean. It's funny because if you want your goal to be the Olympic champion eight years from now, you know, that's kind of nice. Okay, well, you know, what do we do tomorrow? You know, that's <laughs> so, somewhere between tomorrow and eight years is the problem, you know. Mm. And uh, I, I work, that's that's kind of where my focus has always been in my career. You know, what's next? What do we do now? All right. You know? All right. We'll get into um, what you get up to in a second. I'm really interested to hear what, what you actually do on a day-to-day basis as well um, mm. currently. But First off, I just want to say it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast, Dan. Um, Thank you. I, I, mean, I, I got to tell you, you got to raise your standards, but okay. <laughs> I, I have obviously, you know, know one about your work and followed your work for, for many years now. And it's your name comes up time and time again on people to um, get involved with and learn more from. So, you know, my, my understanding of from, from reading your work, certainly from your books, um, which you've got plenty of, Dan, um, I recently just published one there back in February. So I've uh, broke my virginity in publishing books. So, but I've got a long way to go before I reach your, uh, your quantities there. But My understanding from that and something I was hoping to kind of hash out a little bit on this podcast interview with you is really that, you know, you're not, you know, you're not trying to feed people the Kool-Aid, as so to speak, or the magic cure to sell something or become famous. Um, Hopefully you maybe agree with that, but you tell it how it is, Dan, in a very basic but simple 
uh, effective manner that gets the points. So I'm um, hopefully we can um, get you fired up today and get some of those points across that uh, the listeners can really take away. But you know, I gotta I gotta tell you how hard it is. It, it really truly is hard to make to to stay fundamental, to stay basic. Yeah, it's that simple. You know, and there is really no magic. Um, you know, to show up. Um, you know, 365 days uh, every day. Um, get the work in. You know, do do the do the things that have to be done. The, and it's, the real secrets of success are, are rather unsexy. Uh, I was able to retire young because I did those things that literally every listener knows. Every single listener on this podcast knows how to retire young. Yet you have to make decisions about what kind of car you drive, about this and that, and, and, and putting money aside. They, they all know that. Hmm. But Tuesday night at Hooters is wings night, and you know there you are sitting. It's you know three in the morning, and uh, it, it just it just gets away from you. The fundamentals, the basics, aren't very sexy, uh, no matter what your goal set is. Yeah, it's something I've always tried to do in my work, and uh, I've always sort of referenced your material for that. Tell us before we get into that, Dan, a little bit about yourself. You've already note, noted that you're a coach and that you're obviously a previous um, high-level athlete as well. So tell us a little bit about your background, what gets you excited, and what you're currently really passionate about. My back, my background, background. I mean, I'm the youngest of six kids. I grew up in a place called South San Francisco. Very athletic family. Uh, the Vietnam War and all the civil unrest happened when I was young. So I had three brothers go to Vietnam, uh, two are disabled. Uh, so, you know, growing up in my home, uh, sports was, well, I don't know how would you say it. Uh, sports was where things were safe. You know, it's mm -hmm. funny. I, I played American football, which is a very violent game. And that was considered a safe pastime because, you know, no one was actually shooting at you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was young, I thought I would uh, play at a high level in American football. But it just didn't work out. And in the off season, I read a book called Seven Days of Sunday about a guy. And Wednesday has Kenny Avery. And in his off season, he threw the discus, threw the shot, did the hurdles, and then run, ran the 800 uh, meters. So I used to do those four events in the spring. And it's funny because I hurdled a, a long time in my career. Uh, I wasn't a very good shot putter. It's funny now. I'd like to sit down with myself and go, "Hey, you need to move your elbow or something." You know. So, and of course, the 800 meter, meters quickly taught me that I don't want to run the 800 meters. So, uh, and very quickly, I, I I had a lot of success as a discus thrower. I was a state champion in California, which is one of our bigger states. Uh, I was offered a full ride scholarship to Utah State University, which is great. I did really well there. And uh, but the nice thing was my academics were always. Uh, strong too. I, um, it, for the schools I went to, I'd always get the Scholar Athlete Award, which, you know, I know it's bragging, but I mean, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of my, I still, I mean, it's, 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 well, uh, technically I'm still a full time instructor for Columbia College as a religious studies. Uh, 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 in fact, I even wrote the course. Um, it's just funny to think about that. Because I don't even think of that as a full time job. I think it's kind of a nice thing to do, mm -hmm. you know. I, I get I get so enriched by it. Um, but the coaching stuff started uh, in 1979 when uh, Coach Mon, after I competed, uh, he, he knew I wanted to get a master's degree, which is in the United States is the degree after after university you get a master's, okay? Um, and uh, so he asked if I want to be the strength coach and throws coach, and so on. You know, I took that and. Uh, so I started coaching. I was only 21 or 22, and many of my athletes were older than me. Um, and what I learned quickly, it was the best lesson I learned. See, it, uh, Pavel uses that great phrase, if all you have is a hammer, the whole world is a nail. Well, my nail in the beginning was the Olympic lifts, and it really helped the guys it helped. But then when I started moving away from elite athletes, I realized that, that I had a great hammer, that the Olympic list was great, but I need another set of tools. And that's, and that's the long journey of trying to find other tools that can get you to, to your goals. And then realizing years later that the bulk of humanity doesn't want to improve in track and field 
American football, uh, soccer, uh, association football or soccer uh, or whatever. They just want to look better and move better. Hmm. And so where I'm at now, I, I'm in a chair. Okay, that was an attempt at humor, I'm sorry. Uh, but where I'm at now uh, is wonderful. I get up in the morning and uh, I have writing assignments I do for different magazines I write for. I do my college work. I, uh, at 9.30, people show up at my house and we train for an hour and a half every day. After that is when I have my first meal. The afternoons are podcasts or just stuff I might need to take care of. And, and then I have a delightful social life. Uh, I mean, I really, uh, there's a local baseball team here called the Bees, the Salt, American baseball, the Salt Lake Bees. And for example, this Sunday, uh, I have a suite there. And so 17, or I should say 16 of me and Tiff's closest friends will be there and we'll watch a, a baseball game and, and probably have too many beverages and make rude sounds of the other team. And so that's not a bad life. Mm -hmm. My current thing right now, but. You know, of course, Can You Go literally just came out. I mean, as I'm speaking, people are probably getting their copies. Um, but what I'm working on now is I'm, it, there's always been a problem. I, I break down what I do in the weight room into six parts. And it's really very simple. Push, pull, hinge, squat, load and carry, and then the sixth movement, which is basically everything else, okay? And that could be your tumbling. It could be Turkish get-ups. It could be monkey bars or... And anything else you lunge, whatever else you do. But I've noticed through the years that three of them, the push, the pull, and the squat, live by certain numbers um, for strength in the 10 range, uh, for hypertrophy 15 to 25 over time. That's, those are your best numbers. Here's the thing I noticed about those three, is to get better at them, you have to do them. To improve your bench, you have to bench. To improve your military, you have to move. you got to squat to improve your squat. And yet the other movements, the, the two I'm thinking of, the hinge and the loaded carry, with the, uh, the hinge would be like the standing long jump, the swing, the Olympic lifts, um, and the loaded carry is your whole farmer walk, pr prowlers, sleds, whatever. You can improve those without doing them. Well, it's because of mobility. And then I began to think this through is that push, pull, and squat, those are the things that give you hypertrophy, make you look better on the beach or naked. And they're the ones that seem to help your sex drive. Hinging and loaded carries are the two that really provide you your athletic abilities, which I would say thrive because that rhymes with sex drive. In the sixth movement, you know, if a, an animal that wants to kill you shows up and you can climb a tree to get away from it, or you can swim in a, in a river to get away from it, or you can roll on the ground or whatever you need to do, the sixth movement is all about survival. So that got me thinking, okay, well, that's nice. I've got sex drive movements, thrive movements, and survive movements. That's great. So what? Then I ran it through something I've been working on, I mean, thinking about since 1985 when I first read Phil Matthew Tone's book. And, you know, he talks about health and fitness. And, of course, Rob Wolf added longevity to the three. Then I started pl playing around with, you know, how does the sex drive movements, push, pull, squat, help with health? How does it help with longevity? How does it help with fitness? And all of a sudden, I begin to realize that that breaks out kind of nicely into different levels. And then I realized that I see education two ways, systematic and systemic, and that adds to all that. And then all of a sudden, I'm just kind of sitting around going, this this is like the missing link. I've been, you know, it's like you know, I guarantee everything I just said, you know, mm. but to actually say it out loud, you know, you can't work deadlifts like you work squats. You know, no one's going to do, I don't know, I guess somebody could, but uh, there's a Soviet squat program. You can never do that with a deadlift. You know, where one day you do six sets of six with 80% of your best deadlift, and then two days later, you, you couldn't deadlift three days a week for six weeks with that kind of volume. <laughs> but you can squat that way or bench that way or pull up that way. So, I mean, I think we all know that. But I think what I'm trying to do is kind of, un, kind of unpack it a bit. And then I tie it through this other concept, I, I, a concept I got years ago from the, an East German 
He said that first you accumulate, then you intensify, and the third thing is transformation. And transformation is when you apply it to championships or you apply it to the field of play or whatever. And all of a sudden I just see, my, oh, oh, there's a book. <laughs> there's a book, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's kind of where my head's at in, these last, in the last few weeks. Okay, so that's your current core values around sort of training and programming for... Oh, oh no, that's you, you asked me what I'm passionate about. That's oh, okay. All right, okay. So that's what you're passionate about. What do you want my core, core value? Sure, number one is make a difference. That is three words, and that's every decision I make, I ask myself first and foremost, will it make a difference? Will it make someone's life better? Um, my wife and I are heavy donors to a lot of different places financially, and we always, it's, that's the, the number one question. Will it make a difference? Mm -hmm. You know, will, you're going to say, well, yeah, give money, it makes a difference. Well, that's not true. <laughs> that's just not true. So we try to give it to uh, organizations, situations where some money can hit the ground running and really make a difference, or some time and effort, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my, that would be my mission statement. That would be uh, that would be my the center of, of my decision process. And then outside of that, are you still interested in the core thing? Are you still? Yeah, I'd love to hear them. Yeah. Sure. Well, and then our family motto, which is kind of funny, is it's not where you start; it's where you finish. Um, and that uh, it's funny because it's we we just I just got off the phone with my wife talking about situations that's come up. Uh, my wife has a very interesting story, and uh, both of us, I, w I don't want to say rags to riches, that would be, you know, be over the top, but you would have never picked me as the person who would be the, the, the discus thrower I became. Um, on, my, on the academic side, you would have never picked me. Um, so it's not where you start, it's where you finish, is that's kind of our little family model with our daughters. Um, and um, from there, though, you know, uh, I mean, I have basic principles that uh, number one is the body is one piece. And so whenever we train people, I always look at the whole. And when I say whole person, uh, I'm not just talking about their liver and pancreas. I'm talking about their, their family, their community. Um, if, if, if you're a believer at all, their soul, their spirit, uh, their whole life process ahead of them. You know, uh, I saw someone making fun of somebody because they were talking about an event they were doing 30 years ago. And the guy said something like, oh, who cares what happened 30 years ago? Well, my thought is, well, yeah. Well, 30 years ago, it was a big deal. And hopefully the people can still walk upright, you know, 30 years after. Mm -hmm. um, the second principle uh, is that, you know, basically uh, the best thing I can do for you is get to lift weights, pick them up off the ground, put them overhead, or carry them for time or distance. And then number three is, all training is complementary, not complementary, complementary. So what you do on the field of play is going to impact your strength. What you do, break up with your girlfriend, is going to impact your training. Um, sprinting during uh, soccer or uh, football practice is going to impact your sprint work in the weight room. So probably you don't ever need to do sprint work in season with me because you're already doing it out there. So that those are those are my those are my big concepts. Okay, oh. I like that, and I've I've noticed that come across in some of your work that I've actually read as well, maybe on a slightly different re level. Um, I suppose some people will kind of say, "Well, Dan, how do how do we know if it's going to make a difference?" And I'm kind of more so relating maybe towards training side of things here. How do I know what's going to make a difference, and how do I actually know where to start? Like where. Where's that current position or situation, and maybe they don't quite know where they want to go? What's the maybe processes or techniques that you might use to to really drive that out of pull that out of someone? Sure. Well, okay, you're you're asking. I mean, on goal setting or something like that. When I talk to people, there's there's there's. I'm gonna give you two answers. This, both answers will answer your question, but the second one's more relevant. Okay. One of the things. The first question I said is, "What's your goal?" And the second question I always ask is. Will this goal make your life better? And many people I've encountered have never even thought about that. Well, I don't know. 
you want six pack abs, okay? Well, will that make your life better? Uh, I'll pick up more girls at bars. Well, unless you got your top off, they're not going to know you have six pack abs. Why don't you improve your dancing or your social skills? That'll help you a lot more with girls. Um, but, though I can't speak for how things go in Newcastle. <laughs> um, I was in Essex, so I have to be careful. Um, so, you know, is this going to make a difference? You know, I gave up about seven years of my life to become a high-level discus thrower. And I mean, gave up, and I didn't drink, I didn't party, I didn't socialize. I mean, I certainly did them, wasn't it? I wasn't insane, but I really ratcheted down to very little, um, almost none. Um, and you'd ask me, was it worth it? And I'd say, well, yeah, paid for my all my education. I mean, on paper, I travel around the world five times a year. You know, when you add up my t total miles, I mean, I'm, I'm in Europe once or twice a month. I mean, I'm with some of the, yeah, it was worth it. So, yeah, so, but sometimes you have to help people unpack that. You know, uh, yeah. my, my daughter was a state champion in a shot put, and she doesn't look it. She's about 5'4", uh, I don't know how many centimeters that is, I don't, I'm sorry, blonde, blue-eyed, not very big. Whenever she, I always told her, for the rest of your life, on your resume, write down state champion in the shot put. And I told her because I guarantee everybody else looks the exact same, but the little girl with state champion, the shot put, is going to stop the interview. You know, I told my daughter, Lindsay, you put that on your resume because the rest of your life, people are going to go look at that and say, hey, tell me that story. So even though you gave up a lot of time and fun in high school, which really wasn't that fun, for the rest of your life, you've got this little thing that is going to kick a door open for you. If you're looking at then keeping it simple, keeping it basic, Dan, as much as possible, because I know you're you're kind of in line with myself when it comes to all right, you've set these goals, say with with your with your clients or the athletes that you're working with. Um, how do we actually then, you know, keep that around your core values? Because I know you're a big fan of kind of going against maybe some of the traditional approaches, um, like specifically like that whole sort of go hard or go home mentality in the gym or particularly let maybe let me get to the second part okay so how I do it is, is simply this what i focus on isn't what you want i focus on what you need and so we have this assessment called the one two three four assessment where no no hang on if you're an active athlete the whole assessment is this can you compete can you go the book title is can you go the whole question is can you go? I mean, that's, that's it. That's, that's how you assess an athlete. You know, um, I mean, I showed up track meets with huge black and blue marks in my body from pulling a muscle and then the blade, the blood draining down. The, um, boy, there was a time I could barely walk on my ankle because of this reason or that. And when the judge said my name, here we go, you know, uh, so, but for everybody else, I use this thing called the one, two, three, four assessment. And by the way, I use it on uh, elite athletes too. Um, but generally, I know where I'm heading. And then I break people into one of, oh, well, they're ones, twos, threes, fours, five, six, or sevens. If they don't, if they don't fit in that perfect thing, I still train with what I call a six. And what we're going to focus on is, you know, if you need mobility. That's the kind of training we're going to do. Mobility clients are with me are rare, but what I would do is I would stretch the, the muscles that Yonda told us that are getting tight. That's your pecs, your biceps, your hip flexors, your hamstrings. And I would do my best to build up your, the muscles that are weakening, your deltoids, your triceps, your ab wall, and your glutes. Because if I can get your glutes stronger and stretch your hip flexors, magically your pelvis moves into the right place. And all of a sudden your hamstrings aren't so tight anymore either magically. Uh, if I can work your rhomboids and your deltoids a little bit, you know, basically just pressing and maybe some TRX work uh, and stretch your pecs and biceps, uh, all of a sudden now you look like you're a couple inches taller uh, and you also look like you lost about 30 pounds because instead of your belly hanging over your belt, everything's in the in the bowl it's supposed to be in. So if you're a 
a body composition claim, we might just have you do kettlebell swings and ask you to eat a vegetable at every meal, something that simple, or drink more water. It doesn't have to be too complex. And of course, if you're a strength client, you need strength. Well, then that's what we're going to focus on, the fundamental human moves and appropriate reps. So that's so what I'm going to focus on are the things you need to do, not what you want to do. And maybe the, the, what I just did for you there is I just outlined probably the next two weeks of our training. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's simply, too. It, it didn't seem like very much, did it? But honestly, if I can get somebody that makes their living by kicking down doors and shooting people to focus on stretching their pecs rather than doing more bench press, they'll be a lot happier person. They'll be more flexible. Uh, they won't get so uh, jacked up all the time. All right? All right. Yeah, I like it. It's um, very basic, John, right? And it's keeping it to the fundamentals. Oh, it's, well, yeah. I mean, and, you know, and it, from there, for example, you know, but if you're a mobility client, maybe we do the FMS screen on you, or maybe we do all these other fancy screens. But generally, you'll tell me where you're, where you're stiff. You'll tell me, okay, I had a surgery here and I had a surgery here. Ah, so you're a little tight around here and here. Yeah, how'd you know? Well, I was just looking at the stitches, really, and it, it indicated that you might be tight here. Oh, sorry, that noise you hear is my dog. The second I cough, you have to make sure I'm okay. <laughs> so, all right, we've touched that on maybe like mobility and strength training. Say on the opposite side of that, Dan, which would <laughs> probably be very common as well, is the whole sort of weight management, fat well, loss type client. That's a body, com body composition client. And we, we, we have one measurement we use, and that's the height to waist. And it comes from uh, England, uh, Margaret Ashwell, and, of course, Brad Pillen did the same, basically the same thing in one of his, uh, in one of his uh, PDF books. But your waistline should be, if, if I double your waistline, that's how tall you should be. Now, if you double your waistline and realize that you're about, a foot too short, you're a body composition client. You know, uh, you're t <laughs> you're too short for your waistline. Mm -hmm. The ratio should be two to one. Your height should be two. Your waistline should be one. And if you are, I don't care what else you say, you are a body composition client. Uh, Greg O'Gallagher, he likes it even smaller. So it, <clears throat> I'm I'm 72 inches tall. I'm sorry, I don't have the meters for you, but I'm 72 inches tall. So he would expect me to have a 34-inch waistline. Well, as a throwing athlete, I don't think I've been that number since I was young. Because, you know, being a thrower, you you get <clears throat> you get a, a waistline because it's just you just need one. You're constantly battling rotation. So that's that's how I de uh, uh, determine uh, a body comp client. That's interesting. It's uh, something I've never tried before with the whole sort of circumference of the waistline against height. It's interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. Why use anything else? Yeah, yeah. It sounds and, like a very thorough And you can luck with centimeters because if you have a client who say 104 centimeters, which, which honestly a lot of men are now, you know, uh, there's that magic number 100. Let's get to <clears throat> Let's get to 100, then you're at 99, then you're at 98. The problem with inches, which we use here in the States, is, you know, you're at 41 and three quarters, and now you're down to 41 and a half. That's not very exciting versus you were 105 and now you're 103. It's almost the exact same difference, but the centimeters work so much better. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll give that a go. We, uh, if we can get applying that, and uh, I'll let you know what yeah. that's like. Yeah, something you know, new. So, see, the thing about height that's also good is that you'll use height. Your client should also be able to stand and long jump their height. So, you know, if you're a client, you've got a client who's two meters there, one, 184. They should be able to stand and long jump 184. So what's good about height is it really helps you with two, what I would consider important measurements, your waistline and your standing long jump. Now, ideally, you're well beyond that standing long jump mark but if you're under it well then we have to look at your body comp your mobility do you have any glutes do you you know <laughs> you know what, what do you do with your hinge 
it, it really opens the door for some other things. Uh, I've noticed that people who fail the body comp test, their waistline is over, and uh, can't jump, they're staying long jump. Uh, in a way, I hate this, it sounds weird, but they're the easiest clients to work with because they need strength and power. And once they start getting stronger, uh, they need a little bit more lean body mass, which makes them a more efficient fat burning machine. Okay, yeah, some great points there. <clears throat> Definitely something to, uh, to apply. You touched on a little bit there, Dan, I'm going to uh, open this bombshell around nutrition. You talked on getting your athletes and your clients to, you know, maybe drink a little bit more, uh, some more water or some more vegetables with meals. Yeah. What's your then looking at nutrition side of things? How important emphasis do you put that on with your clients or your athletes and perhaps then expand into some of those core values as well? Well, with, with an athlete, uh, I give them the more, more, more diet. Uh, more protein, more fish oil, more water, more fiber. And fiber is the one that's, let's just say, more vegetables. More, more, more. And they really rally around that. With everybody else, because there's so much dietary information out there, what we focus on is first make sure you eat colorful vegetables. Um, <clears throat> at first, you know, with your client, they might not eat any, zero, zilch, none. So somewhere between none and one is a big jump. Um, I have this little thing I try to do, it's weird, but I try to eat eight different vegetables a day. I didn't say eight servings, eight different. So when I go to the store, uh, I buy pre-sliced vegetables all the time, pre-chopped, uh, pre because I know that even though it costs more, I need the vegetables. So if I if I come home with 30 pounds of vegetables, it's just going to rot. I'll never get around to eat them. But if they're pre-sliced, pre-cut, then I'll throw them in the all. I mean, when you come to my house and have like jambalaya, which is an American dish, or a stew or a soup, I can guarantee there's 12, 14 vegetables in there. Because, you know, we make it and then just pour all the extra vegetables that are just floating around. So you can take something as simple as a, you know, a, a pot dish and just toss in some vegetables and there you go. With my, uh, with my elite athletes years ago, we did a very interesting thing. And, and Mike still says it's the best thing I ever told him, is that every day for breakfast he would have eggs and green beans. That's how he started his day. And the green beans had the flip top can, like a beer that flipped up, and then you'd open it up and he'd... You know, he just heat them up and he ate a can of green beans every day for breakfast. Massive hit of fiber, uh, lots of vegetables, and protein from the eggs. And he said it was so easy to do. And so every day he started with a massive amount of vegetables and plenty of protein, and that just started his day off correctly. So that's just a little hint. But when you work with everybody else, number one, the vegetables. Number two, and it's not such a big deal in Europe now, but avoid Frankenstein fats. That's any fat made in a lab. Here in the United States, the corn monopoly is so big that corn oil and corn products are found in everything. And uh, it's funny because I guarantee in 50 years they'll look back and say, the, you know, among the 10 stupidest things we did was eat corn oil. <laughs> so avoid, you know, you know eat butter, uh, eat, your, eat your natural fats. Number three, I tell them, I want you to avoid cardboard carbohydrates. That's any carbohydrate that comes in a bag or a box. And if you do those three things, the veggies, the fats, the carbs, you're pretty much on the right way. Uh, try not to drink your calories. That's a, that's a big one here in the States. And I'm fine if you're drinking. <clears throat> you know, I, I get it. I mean, you, you, you have a couple of pints. I'm fine with that. But if you spend your whole day swelling down soda pop, we can't beat that. We cannot beat the damage that soda does to your body. So those are, those are our big circles, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's great if you can drink your half your, well, it, it doesn't work out. And if you drink your body weight, uh, how would you say it? I, I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to make this work. Drink a lot of water every day. Just drink it. Just get it in. 
<laughs> drink, drink way too much water. Just drink too much water until it comes out the other end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So, okay, I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, good wholesome foods, um, yeah. getting plenty of in, getting hydrated, and stuff like that. How do you go about getting your clients then? Like you said, a little bit about training um, to go from eating you know, a pizza every day for lunch and maybe drinking four pints on an evening. How do you, from your, from what I've read, I, I believe you're probably quite uh, in line with how I like to do it in terms of improving someone's daily habits on a sort of day to day, yeah. weekly basis. Is that still something that you yeah. have? Well, when our gym, our, our resident nutritionist is Mark Halpert. And he has this nice little, uh, nice little arrow. <clears throat> Let's just say the arrow is going left to right, okay? On the far left is candy and crap food, okay? And on the, f in the, no, 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 halfway across is vegetables, fish, water. And the arrow is a perfect diet. He says, forget the perfect diet. Constantly just try to make more choices to the right. Make better choices more often. Um, Josh Hillis, you know, and if you do slide back, Josh says, just just stop for a moment and say, okay, did cramming down these three pounds of cake get me closer to my lean body goals or farther away? Oh, they got me farther away. Okay, so if I'm serious about getting this lean body, I shouldn't eat so much damn crap. Okay, I got it. And But I would strongly suggest being as unjudgmental as I can on the the food side on the food side and just really steal yourself into the area of good habits uh, I follow BJ Fox tiny habits approach I know Josh does that I know Steve uh, Steve Oak, Steve Ledbetter does that uh, most people are moving in that direction where instead of trying to have these massive changes which by the way can happen Tony Robbins is right you can have these epiphanies, as James Joyce said. They're the, they're, they're, they're the can, but generally, it's a very hurtful, painful thing that jars you that far into making these lifetime changes. If, do you follow? Yeah, it, I completely agree. Yeah, like if your spouse leaves you for somebody else, uh, if it, some kind of public humiliation of some kind, uh, but. For the most of us, we just don't have enough pain to wedge ourselves that direction. Um, you know, when I look over my, my career, w what allowed me to do certain things athletically was usually the pain of failure was so clear and so full in my mouth, I, that taste of defeat, that you could spend a year in very serious, very rigorous training and it was the pain of failure driving you up. You know what, though, most people don't do that, and I'm fine with that. So basically, I want you to drink two glasses of water for a month. I don't, I want you, not I want you to work out every day, I just want you to buy a pair of workout shoes, which by the way is, trust me, that's not bad. Um, here's a journal, I want you to write down the date right now. Okay, I want you to write down the last meal you ate right now. Good for you. Look how you did that. Excellent. So that's how you can do a food journal. Really? That's all? Yeah, you just write down what you eat. Ooh, how will I remember to do that? And now we fall back into that little problem. <clears throat> but really, it's that simple. You know, uh, all, so all the stuff I would ever tell anybody is, is pretty simple stuff. Uh, it, it, it's the, the habits at first need to be much smaller than most people think. Um, much smaller. Uh, so shockingly small two glasses of water a day um, I'm gonna brush my teeth twice a day that kind of thing but what's nice is once you master an easy habit it's like you your free will is like a muscle and you can get better and better and better you know ten years from now if you've been doing this kind of thing you're gonna have you know you're gonna have a lot of money in the bank you're gonna have your house paid off you're gonna have everything going for you and people are gonna say how lucky you were you'll be like well, that wasn't really luck. It was I. I did these things, and well, I hate when, I was so when people say how lucky I was to throw the discus far. Really lucky. Yeah, yeah. I asked the discus. I said to the discus when I got in the ring, "Hey, go far for me." 
and it did. You know, it just jumped out of my hand. Yeah, no, I completely agree with the uh, the habit based approach when it comes to nutrition and uh, obviously getting people into the gym and doing the routines and stuff. And uh, it's great to hear that you 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 know you're on that same wavelength and that's what you see in results as well from all that experience as well. So I use it as a check mark group. I uh, so as a check mark, uh, yeah, translate check mark. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, the little front end that's pain, and it's the best lever I know. And then the, the rest of it is tiny habits. Very few people can, I don't even know what the middle is. Well, I, mean, I have a clue. I mean, I, I get in the workshop. But so life is more like, training is more like a check mark. You know, training really, really hard so that you throw up. It's got great value. But you better back up that workout with some long, quiet walks with your dog in nature. You follow? Yes. Most people think you can train at vomit level, you know, every single day. It's just that. That crap does, that doesn't work. So I see the same way as habits. I, I see the same way as in the mental approach. I even see it the same way nutritionally. I mean, I could put you on, on a deserted island, you know, cast away or something, and that would work. But for the rest of us, we need to make those, <clears throat> what Mark tells us, those tiny daily decisions to, to choose wiser most of the time. And when we do choose less wisely, okay, I just chose less wisely. Maybe in the next meal, I'll, cho I'll choose better. Not even better. I hate to even say better because just, you know, let, I don't usually, when I go to a birthday party and I have a lot of ice cream, I was at a birthday party and I ate a lot of ice cream. That's fine. Move on. At my daughter's wedding, I drank too much. That's fine. It's my daughter's wedding. I, you follow? I think, I think we need to move ourselves in that place that, yes, there are times where I don't make perfect choices. But that's okay. I can circle them and explain to you. It's when you make bad choices 23 times a week and you can't explain why. That's when we start to get on the bad side of things. Yeah, Dan, it's great. It's something I always preach, the same thing. So I think it's nice to have someone else and, and uh, like yourself come on here and just give it a bit of an echoing and really yes. reinforce it. So fantastic, mate. All right. Well, okay. We've covered some of your core values with nutrition and your training and what you get up to. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot to take away here, Dan, particularly around, you know, understanding some of your core values there and uh, being able to apply them. There's stuff there to apply. What would you give away to someone maybe listening who's just listened to this last for the last 45 minutes as a, as a quick action plan to apply some of your core values? Well, good question, huh? Well, I would, you know, if you don't mind, um, take a step back and look at yourself. And I mean, it, it comes from my good friend, Steve Ilg. Look at yourself holistically. You know, maybe just take a moment and kind of check in with yourself. Check in with yourself, how you are with your family, your spouse, if you have children, how you're doing there, your community, your country, your world. I mean, that's, these are big. You're, you're God, if you believe, you know. And just kind of sit back for a moment and say, you know, how is my balance and all that doing? Because if you find yourself out of balance and, you know, in, in those, those bigger areas of life, very often you'll find that it's something as simple as that hour or so a day you train is out of balance too. Um, I constantly tell my elite athletes, the number one thing I'm looking at with you is your gaps. What what are you not doing? Uh, what are you not up to standard at? And then we focus on those with laser beam focus. I mean, just attack the gaps, attack the lack of standards or whatever it is. And so I kind of feel that way about one's whole life. Uh, you know, you get one, really you only get one set of teeth in your life. And if you can train your child good dental care when they're, I don't know, two or three, that is such a gift when they're, well, I'm 58, when, you, when they're 58 or 78 or 98. Um, if I teach you how to fall correctly when you're three, four, or five, if you slip when you're 37, I might have saved your life by something that small. But if you never, <laughs> if you haven't ever taken care of your teeth, today's a good day to start. Uh, if you don't know how to fall and do fall practice, Today's a really good day to start. And so with when I work with people, one of the things I try to make them do is find, I, would, 
I hate to say gaps in certain things like community and stuff because it, it's got the edge of me of almost turning this into a religion, but it's like, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to go out and make turkey dinner for all your neighbors, but it would be nice if you waved at them. You know, if, if you don't know any of the neighbors and, and you live in an apartment complex, you know, why don't you go out of your way to meet one or two? Just, to, just, just so that if something ever happens, you've got someone to fall back on. And I, I feel the exact same way about your training. What's going to hurt you is your gap and your lack of standard. That's when the bicep's going to blow off. That's when the pec is going to explode. Um, uh, so so that, that really is, is the basic for me. Okay, Dan. Yeah, fantastic. So really trying to learn how to work smarter and not harder in a lot of the things we do and get started right away. Awesome. And, and then okay. find, find the fastest path you can. Yeah, uh, for sure. Don't, don't keep, you know, in this book I just wrote, I, I did a very funny thing with this book I just came out with. I actually read it. It's the first book of mine I've ever read. And one of the things I came away with is I really preach that enough is enough all the time. You know, once you have enough, you have enough. More isn't going to be any better for you. And that's true with income. It's true with spouses. It's true with love life. It's true with flexibility and strength. And when when you have enough of something, my job is to then circle the next weakness that has just showed up because you've mastered that, if, if, if that follows, makes sense. Yeah, I get it completely. Awesome, Dan. Okay, that's a great, uh, great wrap up. Where can people, the guys listening, tune in or find out more about what you do or maybe get one of your books or something like that? What's the best place? Uh, yeah, go to danjohn.net. And then if you buy the book, if you like, you buy books from the company I work for on Target, then uh, the, the company sends you out extra PDFs and MP3s, like uh, something from Greg Cook and I think something from Josh Hillis and myself. And uh, you get all the formats, including the audio. They're nothing, I have nothing against Amazon. They're, they're a wonderful company, but you don't get those extras. And I don't know, it's kind of, I think it's kind of nice to get I don't know yeah. it's about it's, it's um, most people, even though I stutter and I'm not a very good speaker, a lot of people listen to my books uh, on audio. Uh, okay. You record it's, them yourself? I record them myself. Nice. Uh, nice. It's, it's hard to do. Oh, boy, that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's funny because Laurie will say how much I swear <laughs> and how frustrated I get. And are you, I guess I say, are you kidding me all the time? Yeah. Uh, are you kidding me? I, I didn't know that, but you know, because you get frustrated, and you have to calm down and you have to pick back up. Uh, but it, you know, it comes. She, the, the company does a wonderful job with those. And then, of course, uh, there's a, we're trying to do with uh, with on target. Is my vision in the future is kind of a an audio university of some of the best and brightest names in the business talking for half an hour to an hour on something they're, they're passionate about or experts on. And we've really got, they're called movement lectures. And uh, I just want to see this thing grow and grow and grow so that, I don't know, 10 years from now, if someone coming up has a question about something, it'll already, you'll have this hour long talk and a PDF along with it that kind of fills in the gaps for you. Because, you know, sometimes you can go to a workshop or, hear something and you're like, <clears throat> you know, I, I only understand 5%. I, I, I know what the word is and I actually know how to do it, but I don't know, I don't get it. I don't know why we're doing it. I, I'm sure you must have, your clients, your, you, you must do an exercise sometime and say, I, okay, I know how to do it and I get it. I get, I get sweaty, but I don't know why I should do it. The why is the big thing we try to do with the movement lectures. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of the guys listening will be checking out what you do, and of course, checking out, of course, some of those books as well. So, which I can well, YouTube recommend. A YouTube yeah. channel also, DJ eight four one two three. And if that, if you can't find that, then go to. There's a thing called Facebook. Go to the one called Dan John Strength Coach. Don't go to Dan John because that's a fan page. It's not mine. Dan John Strength Coach. And you'll be able to scroll down and get all the videos in there too. Great. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, fantastic to have a 
in-depth insight into what you get up to and everything. So thank you. Hey, we'll talk again soon, okay? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. See you in a bit.